Okay, this is the second video in our DIY solar electrical installation series. If you missed the first video, it's on uh, sizing our system and how we came up with our load list. This video is going to be about the battery bank that we designed to accommodate that load list. So you may notice I got my wig clipped uh, after about four years of growing my hair. We harvested that crop and sent 10 or 11 inches off to Locks of Love. So maybe in the fall we'll start growing it again, but for now it needed to be short because it's getting hot. After our first video came out we had a lot of feedback and, and uh, questions from people asking me to kind of explain all this watts, amps, volts, kilowatt hours, amp hours business. And uh, I'll try to do that as simply as I can because um, it is a little counterintuitive but you do need to understand all those terms and more, more importantly how they relate to each other when you're building a system because all the different components are expressed in different terms like solar panels are all about watts batteries are all about amps and amp hours uh, and charge controllers you need to know watts amps and volts to configure it all to charge your batteries correctly so I thought I'd cover the terms of what they mean uh, a little bit. A watt is what we're actually after. A watt is a unit of power or a unit of work. Uh, it's the thing that actually does stuff. When you flip your switch, the light comes on, watts are creating action. Uh, the, the electricity is being consumed and light is being produced. <clears throat> Think of a watt also as kind of like a calorie. A calorie is also a unit of work. Uh, that's why calories can be directly converted into watts. If you run for 30 minutes on a treadmill, you might burn 100 calories. This, those calories that are actually doing the work. And then you can eat a cheeseburger and refuel yourself. You would be the battery in that scenario. A watt is what we're after. You can't have watts without the presence of volts and amps. Uh, watts equal volts times amps. That's Ohm's law. And if you know two of those three things, you can always calculate the third. So watts equals amps times volts, amps equals watts divided by volts, and volts equals watts divided by amps. So all of those three formulas go together. If you know two of those three, you can always figure out the third. And you need to know all three so you can calculate things like amp hours, kilowatt hours, and all those fun things. So if a watt is a unit of work that we're after, what are the amps and the volts? A lot of people use a uh, water and water moving through pipes as a sort of an analogy when describing this. So think of amps as the water in the pipe, the volume of the water in a piece of pipe moving at speed, sort of like gallons per minute. The volume of water would be correlate to the volume of current moving through a wire. The voltage would be the pressure pushing the, those amps through the wire. You increase the voltage, you're going to move more power. Uh, you increase the amperage without increasing the voltage, it's going to move slower, but more volume will move. Um, amps and volts correlate to each other if watts stay the same. So if you increase voltage, your amperage reduces. If you increase amperage, voltage reduces. At the end, the same stuff comes out. Now, the last thing that affects all this is resistance um, in the form of heat. When you're trying to push voltage a long distance through a wire, a small wire has a high resistance so you lose a lot of your voltage at the other end through heat the pipe just isn't quite big enough to accept that much voltage also it can heat up and cause a fire so to move voltage a longer distance you increase the size of the cable giving us more room so a lot of the challenge when building a system like this is you want to have your panels as close to your batteries as possible so that the wires are as short as possible so the volts don't have to go as far. That's not always practical. In our situation, the panels we currently have are at the top of a hill 280 feet away and our wires are too small so we have so much voltage drop by the time the energy gets down to the bottom of the hill, uh, it's kind of really a bad thing. It's really inhibiting our, our efficiency. <clears throat> our new system our panels are going to be about 130 feet away from the batteries and we can't get around that. That's just where the sun hits the most during the day. But we've correctly sized our cable to allow for that. Whenever you're running your cable, you want 3% or less, ideally less than 3% voltage drop from point A to point B. And that's kind of where we're at. We're right there at that sweet spot. 
So voltage is the pressure, amps are what the pressure is pushing. At the other end, volts times amps is the watts that are producing the work, they're generating the work. If that's a little bit clearer, then you'll be able to understand batteries and how they relate to solar panels and charge controllers and that other stuff. So that brings me back to our batteries. <clears throat> um, nobody likes to buy batteries. It's one of those things that uh, technology evolves, batteries get better, prices come down. It's like buying a computer in five years. It's not going to be as nearly as good. There's going to be a computer that's 10 times as good at half the cost. It's called Moore's Law. <clears throat> and that's where we are with battery technology today. But we need batteries and we need batteries today. So this is how we designed our battery bank. Okay, our starting point is we know we need at least four kilowatt hours of energy per day based on the load list we created in the first video. We know that we want to use batteries for when the sun is not out and for nighttime use. So our critical loads that need to run 24 seven are the ones we'll primarily be running off the battery. Most of the other things we don't need to run at night, we can do during the day when the sun is out and we won't be drawing off our batteries too much. So this uh, nighttime and cloudy day thing and rainy day thing uh, brings up days of autonomy. How many days do you need to run uh, without sun uh, or if it's been raining for seven days like it has here uh, and your panels can't charge your batteries because there's no sun? Uh, that, that's days of autonomy. So we wanted to do three days of autonomy. That is three days without recharging the batteries. Now our current system is a 12 volt system and it has 18 six volt batteries. And I'm not sure what the amp hours of any of those batteries are. This is the system that we inherited. So it's very difficult to program a charge controller to make sure that uh, it's not overcharged or undercharged or any of that type of stuff. And so that's what we're going to replace. Now before you go ahead and decide what type of battery bank and how, how to design it, first you need to decide what type of what system voltage you're going to use. Is it going to be a 12 volt system, a 24 volt system, 48 volt system? Our current system, as I said, is a 12 volt system um, and we have a 12 volt inverter. The higher the voltage if, of your system, the more efficient it is if you're using a lot of AC appliances. The reason for that is the way the inverter works. An inverter has to take the 12 volts of your 12 volt system and multiply it and calculate and, and invert it up to 120 volts that's a 10 times increase from 12 to 120 volts that's a lot of work for an inverter so a 24 volt system only has to do half that a 48 volt system you only have to more maybe two and a half times that or double that and so it's much more efficient for that inverter to not have to convert 48 volts to 120 volts uh, it'll run cooler, it'll last longer, and uh, you, you can have a lower amperage battery bank because your voltage is higher, producing the same kilowatts. So, we've decided on a 48 volt battery bank because we think it's going to be the most efficient to allow us to run all of our AC appliances. And some of the DC appliances we want to run, we're going to run off of our repurposed flooded lead acid batteries that we'll build a little bank for just DC appliances. So now we know our, the voltage of the system we're going to build uh, and we need to match our batteries to the inverter that we're going to use. You want your batteries to be generally two times the kilowatt rating of your inverter. So if you have a uh, 4000 watt inverter, uh, you want your battery bank to be able to produce at least twice that, so 8000. You also want to match your battery bank to your charge controller so that the rate of charge that the batteries can accept fits the charge controller. So if your charge controller outputs 80 amps, you want your batteries to be able to uh, accept 80 amps, uh, have a charge rate of at least 80 amps. If it's lower, then you're just wasting energy coming out of your charge controller because your batteries can't take it. If it's higher, then your charge controller isn't big enough and your batteries aren't being charged as quickly as they could be if you had a larger charge controller. So there's all those factors that you have to consider when you're designing your system. Batteries match charge controller, match inverter. There's a bunch of different kinds of batteries out there. The most common is a flooded lead acid or a sealed lead acid. It's super old technology invented back in the 1800s. It's still in use today in many applications because of the batteries are inexpensive to buy up front. Um, they're very heavy. They're filled with lead plates. You have to maintain them with uh, distilled water. You have to measure their specific gravity. Uh, there's a lot of maintenance involved and they're really not that good. 
uh, you can you have to baby them to get the most life out of them as you possibly can and even then maybe 3500 cycles at 50% depth of discharge so you can only discharge them half uh, without really damaging their ability to accept charge uh, they're very sensitive to temperature so if it's down close to freezing you don't want to be trying to charge a lead acid battery uh, without damaging it so the advantage of a flooded lead acid battery is that they're readily available and they're relatively inexpensive per battery uh, a lot of people will buy two volt batteries or six volt batteries and then string them together in series which increases the voltage but leaves the amperage the same so if I wanted to build a 24 volt battery bank I could buy 12 2 volt cells that I have say 800 amp hours each and I could wire those together in series which increases the voltage but leaves the amperage the same and I would wire 12 of them together to get my 24 volts and 800 amp hours wiring in series increases voltage but the amps stay the same wiring in parallel increases amps and the voltage stays the same when you're doing a battery bank usually out of uh, flood flooded lead acid batteries you're doing kind of a combination of both you can make two strings wired in series and then wire those two strings together in parallel to come up with the voltage and amp hours that you need for your battery bank so I mentioned flooded lead acid batteries because they are probably the most common there's also sealed lead acid which they say you don't have to maintain because they're sealed there's absorbed glass mat which uh, isn't very much better if it is at all uh, they have there was a thing with saltwater batteries a couple years ago, but that company that was making them is now, I think, gone. So that was a promising technology, but ended up kind of not going anywhere. Uh, but the new hot technology is lithium ion. You find lithium ion batteries in every gadget that you own now. And the reason for that is you can discharge them almost up to 100% uh, and then recharge them without any significant damage to them. It's still not a good idea to do 100% discharge of any battery because uh, it shortens the life. So because you can only discharge flooded lead acid batteries 50% without damaging them, you need to double it to uh, account for the amp hours that you are trying to reach. So if, I'm, if I've got a battery bank that's 900, 900 amp hours, uh, I can only use 450 of those, and so I need to double my battery bank just because I can only discharge them a half, 50%. The other thing to factor in is I've my three days of autonomy. Now I have to triple that bank to cover my three days. So now we're getting into tons and tons of batteries, lots of cable, lots of maintenance, and I still only get 3,500 cycles warranted. And, and uh, I have all the temperature issues. You know, I can't charge it when it's cold. I, there, it's just a big hassle. And so that's the trade-off for the low upfront cost. Now the difference between that situation and the situation we're going with with uh, simplify lithium iron phosphate batteries is I can discharge these batteries up to 80% and they're warranted for 10,000 cycles or 10 years <clears throat> which is a lot that's like 27 years if you do one cycle per day these ba these batteries are recyclable they don't have the temperature issues that flooded leaded acid batteries have they have a built-in battery management system in each cell or each unit uh, that keeps it from overcharge and undercharge and temperature runaway and things like that. And they have an 80 amp breaker on them as an, kind of an on-off switch as well. These batteries from Simplify can only be wired in parallel. You cannot wire them in series or you'll blow them up and you'll avoid the warranty. And that's why they offer them in 12, 24, and 48 volt versions. Um, so that actually makes it a lot simpler to design and build your battery bank uh, I can I have six batteries here these 48 volt batteries are 67 amp hours each so I just add batteries and increase my amp hours as I'm doing that my, because my voltage is staying 48 volts because everything is, has to be wired in parallel so pretty much two of these batteries gives me one day of autonomy I have six batteries that's three days of autonomy if I wanted to add two more days I would add four batteries and then it just makes it super simple. So for my 4,000 watt hours a day, I need three days of that. That would be 12,000 watt hours. And then I need to factor in an additional 20% to 
to account for the 80% depth of discharge that I'm allowed to do on these batteries. That brings me to 14.4 kilowatt hours that my battery bank has to have at minimum. Put that another way, my four kilowatt hour requirement divided by my 48 volt system gives me 83.33 amp hours per day times three days of autonomy gives me a 250 amp hour battery bank. Then I add my 20% uh, to account for the 80% depth of discharge, which gives me a minimum capacity that I need of 300 amp hours. So my battery bank needs to be at least a 300 amp hour battery bank. Now taking that 300 amp hour requirement, I also have to factor in the efficiency of the inverter I'm going to be using. Because anytime you pass electricity through anything mechanical, you're going to lose efficiency through the form of heat. Now my inverter is 95% efficient, which means I'm losing 5% of the efficiency by moving the energy from the batteries through the inverter into my outlets. So to calculate for that, I've got 67 amp hour batteries. I have six batteries, which gives me 402 amp hours. I need to account for the 80% depth of discharge that I'm allowed to do. So I subtract 20% from that 402 amp hours, giving me 321.6 amp hours. Now I multiply that by 0.95 to factor in my inverter efficiency. I end up with 305.5 amp hours available capacity or 14.6 kilowatt hours, which is right at where I need to be based on the system I've designed. So I like the idea of using these batteries because they have a 10 year warranty. Supposedly you can get 10,000 cycles out of them at 80% depth of discharge. They're super convenient, compact, lightweight, comparatively speaking. They're 77 pounds each. They're easy to hook up. You can only hook them up in parallel and you just add amp hours as you add batteries. You don't have to fiddle with wiring things in series to get low voltage batteries up to the battery bank size you need. You just hook them up. Big thing you have to make sure you do is make sure all your wires between batteries is exactly the same length so that they all charge and discharge at the same rate. And let's take a look and see what we're talking about here. Okay, I'm unboxing this first battery. It's got a quality control sheet here, starting voltage, inline meter, battery passed all function checks, uh, no scratches, serial number. All, term all terminals have nuts and lock washers added. And then it's signed and dated April 5th, 2018. So that's pretty cool. These are 3.5 kilowatt, 48 volt batteries. Lots of juice. Jeez. Fancy accordion packaging. Okay, this is your uh, 80 amp breaker and basically acts as an on off switch so you can wire everything up, get everything set before you turn your batteries on. That eliminates the whole sparking action that happens when you're messing with flooded lead acid batteries, so that's a good thing. It comes with the terminals, little caps, so you can uh, connect your watt cable and then use the caps you know, you run your cable through here and everything's protected from anything falling on this bare metal because our chickens like to hang out on our battery bank and that's not a good thing. Now, another good thing about these is uh, you can put these, they make racks for like racks for each battery that you can stack up. But you can also, um, you can put these on their side. You can kind of configure them however you need to. You don't have to keep them upright like you do flooded lead acid batteries. Now they are heavy, they're 77 pounds, but I like it. It's so it's cool, it's modular, it's simple to hook up, it's simple to use. Uh, it takes a lot of the math and guesswork out of designing your battery bank. 48 volt battery, three and a half kilowatt hours. So with all these different variables and all these different pros and cons of each different type of battery technology, they're all over the board. How do you boil it all down to one common set of numbers so you can compare apples to apples and make your decision? What I did was figure out cost per cycle and cost per kilowatt hour stored and used. You can do that with any type of battery and so that's how you can compare apples to apples. For example, when I was considering 
lead acid batteries. I was looking at Trojan 6 volt, 900 and some amp hour batteries. I would have needed eight of them. Uh, they're good for 3,500 cycles. I would have had to replace them three times. I would have had to have had three sets over 10,000 cycles to get my 10,000 cycles compared to these batteries which are warranted for 10,000 cycles. And so I'll never have to replace these to get my 10,000 cycles, supposedly. And my calculation for the flooded lead acid battery ended up being $2.62 per cycle. That is charge discharge. Now you can factor in the 30% federal tax credit that's still available when you uh, put together a new system. Uh, that would bring the cost down to $1.83 per cycle for flooded lead acid batteries. And uh, that would be 24.3 cents per kilowatt hour, which is pretty high because we, had we would have had to replace those batteries two other times. With these batteries, because they are good for 10,000 cycles, I calculated that the cost per cycle would be $1.29. Uh, the cost per kilowatt hour after the tax credit would be $0.08, cents, which is down to where it's a pretty manageable uh, cost compared to being on grid. So yes, these cost quite a bit more money up front, but because you get a lot more life and you can charge and discharge uh, more of the battery, uh, it's a better investment long term. So that's why we went with Simplify Batteries. So step two was designing our battery bank. We need 4,000 kilowatt hours a day. We've designed a battery bank capable of 14.6 kilowatt hours at 305 and a half amp hours. Everything is going to run off our batteries, so that's where we start. From there we move to calculating our solar panel needs to charge our batteries as quickly as possible, usually two to three hours, and that's going to be our next video. Uh, we're going to talk about our solar panel array and combiner boxes and things like that. So stay tuned and we'll see you there. Thanks for watching.